Hello, good afternoon. My name is Susan Oxtaby. I'm the Director of Film and Senior Film Curator at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's live stream, which uh, centers on the new film, Ermi, a film that's uh, co-directed by Veronica Silver and Susan Fanshall. The film recently received its world premiere at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. And now BAM PFA is really honored to be able to present the virtual cinema a streaming uh, opportunity for this film. It's on our platform and we expect to host this film through the end of 2020. So I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to watch the film and to let your friends and families know about it. It's a beautiful film. Um, the BAM PFA website is bampfa.org and there on our home page, you'll find the streaming film section and uh, there you will find Ermi. Ermi is a documentary portrait of Ermi Silver who lived between 1906 and 2004. She had a long and fascinating life, one touched by love and tragedy, challenges and resilience. The film is based on her memoirs and traces Ermi's personal story across the political and social history of the last century. From her upbringing in a Jewish family in Chemnitz, Germany, to her flight from Nazism with her husband and young children, to beginning life again in New York City. Ermi is beautifully conceived, finely balanced and exquisitely paced. So this afternoon, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome our three guests. It's a great pleasure to welcome co-directors and co-editors, Veronica Silver and Susan Fanshell, as well as Todd Bokelheide, who holds the music credit for the film. It's just, I, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to speak with these three very experienced and award-winning filmmakers and, compo and composer. Veronica Silver is a Bay Area filmmaker who is specialized in social issue documentaries. Her own directorial credits include KPFA on the Air, Raising the Roof, Cape Song, and now Ermi. Films that she's co-directed and co-edited include You Got to Move, First Look, and the DuPont Columbia Award winner word is out. Additional selected editing credits include on company business and Berkeley in the 60s, uh, an Academy Award nominee and the America Cinema Editors nominee for best edited documentary. Susan Fanshell is a documentary filmmaker and editor whose, whose films include A Weave of Time, Vocals and Company, Made in the Bronx, Six American Families, The Kennedys of New Mexico, and The Odyssey Tapes. The films she has edited and received have received the highest awards in broadcast journalism, including three Peabody Awards, two DuPont Columbia Awards, and two Emmy Awards. Fanshall began her career in the, Berkeley er in the Bay Area uh, after graduating from UC Berkeley with a Master of Fine Arts degree, and she currently resides in New York City. And our third guest, Todd Bokelheide, um, having edited picture and sound and mixed numerous films, Bokelheide presents a wealth of experience and sensitivity in the way that he approaches scoring for cinema. He's earned an Academy Award, an Emmy, Emmy, an Emmy and numerous other awards and nominations. And he has worked with such filmmakers as Carol Ballard, John Els, David Fancher, and Milish Foreman, also, Philip Kaufman, David Lynch, David Peoples, Lourdes Portillo, and Christine Samuelson and John Haptis, among other filmmakers. So those are their uh, storied backgrounds, and I want to welcome all three of our guests. And maybe first now, to, um, to start off, I thought it'd be very important to establish how you each uh, came to this collaboration to Ermi, how you came to work together on Ermi. Maybe I could start with Veronica. And I think Veronica, you'll have to unmute yourself. There. Great. Hello, Susan. Hi. The introduction, hi. Yeah. Um, so your question is about collaboration. I think that's yeah. what, um, what, what we're really interested in here. And, and um, you know, while I started the film by myself because it was my, my idea <laughs> to make a film about my mother. Um, I, uh, 
knew, I think I knew just from the very get go that I would be collaborating. And I knew furthermore that I'd be collaborating with Susan. It was certainly my, my, my deep hope um, and Susan and I have known each other since high school. We're the dearest of friends and we took parallel paths in filmmaking. Um, I started on my own because I wasn't sure where I was going yet with, with the film about Ermi. A, I would say that a turning point and really a starting point for the film was when, when actually my friend Rob Epstein suggested that I use Ermi's memoir as a structure for the film, as a through line. And that gave me a platform on which to then start building Ermi's story. And I worked on that for, for some time by myself and did, did with, with John Haptis and Michael Chin, I did, they filmed interviews that I did with people that I thought were significant in, in Ermi's life, of course, my sister naturally and cousin and others. And once I had gotten up to a certain point in the film is when I enlisted Susan. I don't mean that she was waiting in the wings. I, I probably, waited for her to be available also. But once that collaboration began, we really, the film really took off, I, I would say. That is to say, we, we found an ending, which took a long time. And um, yeah, it just, it just took years, years for us working together. And when we were satisfied with our cut, enter Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we had worked with temp music throughout, of course, and then it was clear that we needed a composer and, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there for now, for others to pick up. Yeah. Okay, and Todd, I understand um, you as you have the music credit on the film, but in this instance, that really means a combination of composing original music and arranging uh, music by other composers is? I really only did one uh, arrangement. That was for the, the um, yeah, the, the piece for uh, Hermes' father's death. But no, the rest of it was all, they had picked, um, Susan and Veronica had picked a lot of music for the film. When I first saw it, it was wall to wall with um, beautiful and interesting classical pieces that, covered quite a range of styles and, uh, and eras. And it was actually, I mean, it was a very, I thought a very interesting and beautiful score in its own way, a little, you know, fragmented because you, if you're going to so many different sources, it's going to feel um, a little, I guess, just disjointed, you know, it's not gonna have a lot of coherence, but there were there was a lot of good music in the film and it was a bit daunting i thought you know how am i gonna rise to this this sort of level and have um give the film the the kind of breadth of style and era and um you know sophistication that it that it really deserved so i yeah but i i think Many artists feel that way starting on a project. You feel like, you know, uh, okay, I've done this for a long time, but I've also never done it before. <laughs> so, um, but it was exciting. And it was, it was also pretty uncertain at the beginning how much I would be doing. I think, I think Veronica was not sure she wanted original music. You can confirm that, Veronica, if you wish. Um, I was resistant, let's put it that way. <laughs> And I, you know, and I didn't want to push it, you know, I, I kind of wanted to, to let you, you know, it was your mother's story, very personal film. Uh, I felt as though all the decisions that you'd made in the film were, were really good ones. And the film was looking really good and feeling very, um, just feeling complete and, and, uh, and whole. And so I didn't want to upset the balance too, you know, too much, but time went on and, um, you know, we kind of, kind of got more and more interested in more and more of, of the music coming from me. And I'm glad we did. I mean, uh, the score feels great. The film feels really unified. And um, I, I love the result. I think it's, I think it's a wonderful film. 
And Susan Fanchel, um, I think you were very much in favor of bringing on uh, a composer on the project. Am I right? Let's see. You'll have to unmute, I think. Again, am I, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yeah. Yes, I would say that I always, as we were evolving the film and as we even were scoring the film, and we, we both liked a lot of the music that we had found to score the film with. Um, but I would say that throughout the process, I was imagining Todd coming in. I didn't know him. I only met him when, once we hired him, but I was imagining his presence as a, I think he'd used some of the words that were in my head to describe what I felt would be offered by a, by the right composer working with us. And that's a, unif a unification of, of the film. Um, also, something that was particularly unique to this film, you know, that, that it would have the, the music and the sounds of some of, that were unique to this film and that it would have a theme that would bring forth some of the mysterious emotional things that music can give a film that were particular to Ermi. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I always imagined that the film would leap into its full existence with music. You know, I think, I, um, I think it might be helpful for our viewers if we were to show an opening clip from the film. And we were thinking of showing the first four minutes of Ermi um, so that you could, we can all have a sense of, um, you know, the very delicate qualities of this film and how it's, uh, it sets out the beginning of the narrative arc. So I think if, if we panelists um, stop our videos and mute ourselves, we can play this clip now. When I think of visiting my mother in New York City, I see the door to her apartment. I ring the doorbell and I hear her voice saying, coming, coming, and then the door opens. And I'm back. It was on the 12th floor and had a clear view of the city. It was flooded with light, and there were always lots of plants along the windowsill. The apartment was a mix of the old and the new. The artichoke, the landscape and the style of the French painter Coho, and especially the memorial painting to her first family. All three paintings had survived the war and were bridges to her past. Yet, it was a place that fully greeted you in the present. It was her world, and it welcomed you in. Ermi is one of those few people whose physical presence stays in my head. She was so full of life and energy and enjoyment. She had a, an exuberance that uh, exceeded anyone else that I remember. The woman could laugh. And my God, with that history, but she could laugh.
left alone and without distractions or interaction with people, she could have a tremendous amount of anxiety that was expressed non-verbally. I had the feeling like she really came alive when she was with people and that in her own company, there was some torment that was there that followed her. In her mid-80s, my mother wrote a memoir. Recalling the details of her past and writing them down was not easy for her. She struggled finding the language and the confidence to express herself. The result is her story with the details she chose to remember. That's just beautiful. Um, and I thought in this first section, we could talk about editing, music composition, and, and some of the creative decisions that you each brought to this, uh, this section that we just saw, which is, um, shows us how wonderfully the film uses archival imagery, home movies, um, even animation in the opening sequence, um, and also the very the beautiful lightness of touch that we hear in the music and um, in the way that you bring this all together in terms of image and sound. So I don't know if this is throwing this out to all three of you, but if we could, um, if you could maybe share some insights into how you approached um, your work on this opening sequence. <laughs> well, one, one element that we um, haven't brought up actually is, is the, um, the animation, the, 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 um, Ermi's apartment in, in the drawings that, um, that Catherine Margerin, the, the French animator did. Um, and um, we, we did think that we would start with, with, with Ermi's apartment, um, but we didn't, have, we didn't have the proper images to do that. So Susan, I'm sure it was Susan who came up with let's animate. <laughs> and um, that, that opened up a possibility of doing something, something, I, I, I guess, original. And anyway, it suited what our needs were. And um, I think it, it brought a kind of lightness, I suppose, that, that I, I hope was helpful to Todd. I just want to say um, one thing about, just to help set up Todd a little better, mm -hmm. and that's that we had fully constructed that, that, that all those transitions by the time Todd had come on. In, in other words, all the elements were there, but we were using probably four different music cues in order to take us through the kinds of changes that we wanted to feel in this very short intro. We didn't want it to be one piece of music that only had one flavor to it. So we had constructed a, um, a series of, of pieces of music to take us through that. And um, at the point that Todd started to work on the film, um, he, he, he actually created what you see now as one um, piece of music that really has its own changes. And, and I don't want to um, speak for him in terms of his process, but that's, wh that's where he came in. Yeah, and that's the hard thing about working with pre-existing music is usually, it's, it's very hard to find music that has enough changes that fit what you're trying to do story-wise. And so that's where, you know, original music can really help because music for film is storytelling more than it's music, pure music. It really, I mean, anything that goes into a film is storytelling, any imagery, animation and you're right Veronica the the lightness of the 
of the animation really was inspiring to me, that and your voice, which, you know, just from the beginning that when the doorbell rings and you, and you depict your mother saying, coming, coming, you know, there's such a, it's, it's just unusual. And it's such an inviting sound that you made and in, in just saying those words and the way you said them. And I'm assuming that it's fairly true to the, to the tone that your mother would have used. Um, so that told me a lot that, and um, you know, it's a complex, that four minutes, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, we start with that plane ride, which is just prologue and uh, not, not doesn't function very much dramatically. But once we get inside the apartment, you're telling us all kinds of things. The animation is telling us how light and bright and positive the environment is. And then we start to see paintings and we start to walk down towards some darkness and we feel the darkness and the music follows that. We sit on that the memorial painting is all you say about it. And so it, it sort of starts the mystery of, well, what did happen here behind, the, behind all this? And then we need to recover in the next shot of animation where we're going across and you say that, you know, but she, she invited you in, she welcomed you into her life. And so the music gets very bright again and her friends start recounting that she was the most energetic person they'd met. And so that's, that's very, you know, fast moving. You see her imagery in the car and with the kids and it's, it's all very kind of, wow, you know, this is really a vivacious person. And then we slow down again and we see her kind of sitting by the toaster or radio in the thirties, they all look the same. Um, and the music's very slow and, you know, potentially mournful, I think, um, certainly thoughtful. And then we, <laughs> we got to build back up again for the main title, you know, but it's, you can tell that there's, we've, we've digested some of the depth of her life in some way, sort of unconsciously. And so the title's a bit slow and broad and, um, you can feel some gravity in it. And then when her story comes on and, and Hana Shigula's wonderful voice comes on, it's um, then it's time for the music to just kind of be a mood. And it's a mood of um, contemplation and kind of waiting. It, it, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a waiting game at that point. Uh, but also, and you can feel an expansion of possibility. It's just kind of, it's saying, listen to this, listen to this wonderful actress reading these wonderful words. So it was a wonder, you know, I mean, it's a very hard actually <laughs> to make all of that work. All of those ups and downs, the tempo changes, um, challenging uh, and, but really rewarding. I mean, I, I, I'm very happy with the result and all of the, and you know, the collaboration on all that was really, it was crucial and really, um, I mean, collaboration, true collaboration in film work is, is, is rarer than it should be, um, you know, where everybody uh, sort of really has the same goal, which is to make the best piece possible and where there's no, no real selfishness in it, uh, where it's not about somebody's ego being stronger than another's or someone winning the sound versus picture argument or whatever. I mean, it's a synergistic art. Uh, the job of a film is to bring people to a new place and, and to bring everyone to their best self. I, that's my personal philosophy. I, I, you know, I wish for that in every film I go to see, I want to, I want to, I want to be a better person after I've seen it and during. Um, Todd, I wonder if, if you could comment on some of the choices you made around instrumentation uh, for... Yeah, sure. Well, we, Veronica was good friends with Sarah Cahill, the wonderful pianist, a uh, local pianist, uh, quite an institution in the area. And so I thought, okay, great piano player, let's feature piano. Um, and piano is, is, you know, everyone knows it's a quite a universal instrument. Um, it can cover all kinds of territory. It's been around forever and it's, and so, and I knew that one of the goals of the score would be to help us help kind of illustrate and uh, bring out the changes in era. I mean, you know, Ermi had a very long life. And so starting, I mean, though the, the piece that we just watched, it doesn't start sounding of the era really at all. It just, it's more of a, you know, introducing the thematic, the themes and the, the sort of milieu of 
of my score. I mean, what the music overall is going to do. Um, but piano, violin, cello is most of what we hear in that in that first four minutes. Uh, and it's a lot of what we hear through the film, though we have some other, there's some woodwinds and some uh, uh, more strings and stuff. But it's, um, so I just, you try to use your assets, you know, Sarah, you've got Sarah Cahill on, ba on, on board, you're gonna, you know, try to make the most use of her. I think Sarah might be listening. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> That's great. So another uh, major area is, of course, how music and sound effects work together. And I thought we might be able to discuss um, some of those relationships in terms of um, how we, under the score, there's also layered in certain sound effects. And these are obviously very carefully chosen and uh, relevant to the historical period that we might be in, in terms of the arc of or the, the, the story of Ermi's life. So I realized that um, Philip Perkins was another um, member of the team um, as a sound editor and, and, and re-recording uh, credit on the film, but maybe you three could be, um, could share some ideas uh, or give us a sense of how you work that out. Um, layering in sound effects, it was, were they there and then the composition came after or was that a process that you were uh, developing back and forth over a period of time on the on the project? Susie. Go, Go for we, it. we were we were using um, all of the elements throughout the editing process. It wasn't as if we did a picture edit and then we did a music edit or you know. Mm -hmm. We were always involved with all of those elements, sound and voice and music. But as we worked on the film for a long time, um, it got more and more developed. Um, and certainly at the point at which Todd was writing music, we also were working with Phil. And we really uh, would be great if he were here too. He, he, he contributed so much to the overall um, a lot of what he did initially was to fix the sound because we had um, recorded sound in all kinds of different locations and especially when it involved dialogue just the clarity of the sound and the smooth, smoothness of the sound is something that you don't stop and listen to you don't say oh how smooth is that sound but he worked very hard to make it that way and, um, and then in the final stages of the film, he was really designing the sound to, to coordinate with, with Todd's music. He didn't do a lot of the final sound effects until he heard what Todd was doing. And then he wanted to work around that with him in, in a collaborative way, even if they weren't in the same room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, by the way, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. So, incidentally, uh, Phil sends his very best. He's on a shoot today, or he would be piping, talking later. He, but he does send his very best, and he he considered he considered the the composing of he called it a saga. <laughs> there was a lot of back and forth between between Todd and Phil, who've worked together quite a bit. Isn't that right, Todd? And yeah. you know, sort of adjusting adjusting the, 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 the balance between sound effects and, and music. One of the things that happened with sound effects is that I would say that in many cases, we, we, we lost them. That is to say we had them and we took them away. That would be one, one element that happened, one aspect that happened of sound effects. Uh, for example, I mean, this is so trivial, but I'm still gonna say it. Uh, in the very opening, which we saw, um, we have one sound effect, basically, which is the the doorbell to Ermi's apartment. We had we had a kind of hum of airplane in. We had a door slamming when Ermi shuts the door with the kids going in, and we we lost those. Um, so it it's a very it it's it's. It, it, 
it, it's a very intuitive thing when, when to use sound effects and, and which ones, which we were very careful in terms of, you know, the train sound effects we worked over a lot, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a second clip that, again, I think it's helpful for our listeners to have a sense of the film as we're talking about it. So maybe we could um, cue up this next clip, um, which is uh, about 34 minutes into Ermi. Uh, and it starts uh, with a section in the New York subway. So why don't we, why don't we show that and talk about that scene coming out of it? When I returned to New York, I began to fully explore the city. An early vivid impression came from a subway ride I took. A man sat next to me reading a Jewish newspaper with no apparent sign of discomfort or attempt to hide his Jewishness. I loved New York from that day forward. and passed the exam for my American massage license in the spring of 1942. I also decided to volunteer for a German-Jewish organization raising funds for the American war effort. And I made an appointment with a Mr. Cohen to sign up. So I went to 42nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. I went up and I asked for Mr. Cohen I had to wait, Mr. Cohn didn't come, the door opened, and somebody else came in, and he introduced himself. I am Henry Selber. <laughs> and I said, and I'm Ermi Girls. And then I fell in love, and I thought it's impossible that I ever been born in love with a man because I was not interested in, in men anymore. And it really was a coup de foudre. And so I somehow was happy and unhappy, happy that it was still possible to fall in love and unhappy that he didn't react at all. <laughs> <laughs> but after a few days, we had a dinner together and another dinner together, but I was not yet divorced. I still was married. At that time, one had to go to Reno. I had to stay there six weeks in order to become a resident. I met a cross-section of America that I never met before. Yeah, Again, it's a great section. Maybe we could um, hear your thoughts on how, how this scene came together, both uh, with the score uh, and uh, maybe some of the backstory on this, this scene. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, st I'll start by saying, saying that, um, that one of the things that um, you don't really want to do with music is you don't want to use music as filler. And um, this was a section that had a fair amount of information in it certainly leading up to, to Ermi meeting Henry. And so... <laughs> what happened? I think we can just continue, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and, and so, so um, the quality of the music had to be really, uh, really meaningful to um, not feel as if we were just um, using the music to work through this, um, this sequence of, of information. I don't know. I don't know if that was true, if you remember that, the two of you, in the same way. Well, I remember being very intentional about what I was doing, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't mention clarinet before in terms of instrumentation, because it did end up being pretty important in the film. Um, but 
Yeah, I wanted that to, you know, she talks about seeing a man on the subway reading a, a Jewish newspaper without fear uh, or embarrassment. And I wanted, that's probably the most Jewish piece that, I, or Jewish sounding piece that I wrote for the film. It's, it's still the same main theme, but it's treated, treated differently. Um, uh, and I wanted it to be fun. You know, it, it just that she had just left the chicken farm that her, <laughs> her, her uh, second short-lived husband, um, not that he was short-lived, but the marriage was, short anyway, she was coming into her own. She was in New York again, and, or not, not again, I guess for the first time, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it needed to be welcoming in a really new way. And, and uh, it was, I just thought it was a great sequence and, and what she says is interesting. And anyway, I, yeah. Well, you definitely capture uh, that that historical moment and and the joie de vivre and yeah, it's it's I think I think it's a really, really wonderful uh, part. And I mean, was there um, source music in there that you were responding to, or what was there? Um... We had a, we had a, a Louis Armstrong piece of of jazz that came in with that was. That was quite wonderful um, when the when the train comes in, you know, with a, a kind of a, a sound effect that that you can make with it with with the trombone. Anyway, not the trombone, the trumpet. I, anyway, um, that would have been a, that was a good example of a piece of music that we had put into the film, um, never ever being able to clear the rights to it. So no matter what, we would have had to replace it. Um, but Todd's replacement was beautiful. He, yeah. This is the this is going into into uh, Nevada for the for the divorce, mm -hmm. not the subway ride. Sorry, not right. the subway. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember what you had before that in the subway ride. Did you remember, Veronica? Yes. Well, I I remember that that was that we had the first time. Um, the first time we came back to New York, it, it, we, we, weren't in, we weren't in the subway, but we were in New York and New York streets. I had, um, I think Don Byron, a uh, uh, very, very intentional Yiddish playing music. And um, Susan, if I, can, if I can say this, I think this, Susan felt it was just too obvious, too obvious. So we moved toward jazz. We, we looked for a piece of jazz and we never were able to settle on the right piece of jazz for that subway sequence. But we, we tried, we tried Duke Ellington, we tried, I, I forget who else, and, and nothing, nothing was just right. You know, these things are so, you think once you have something in there that it just sort of happened, you know, it happened one, two, three, it, it doesn't. There's a tremendous amount of, of, um, of trial and error that goes into it. And uh, you just hit the, you know, you just got it. Would you say, Susan? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there were some parts of the music that Todd replaced that we let go of reluctantly because we had gotten very attached to them for one reason or another. But there were other pieces of music that were never right. <laughs> they were just there temporarily. I just, and so I was so happy when they were gone. Yeah. <laughs> But when we see the uh, the credit roll for for Ermi, we see that there are six uh, pieces that were kept in the film, and I thought maybe this would be interesting to discuss discuss how um, how they stayed in or how you um, made that decision uh, to keep. I'm thinking of um, there's a kind of a vocal hymn that's sung during the ha the Sabbath uh, in the London sequence uh, when there's a synagogue and a um, following the. Uh, the sinking of the Simon Bolivar ship. Um, that's a very interesting hymn. I think it. I think it's credited as the uh, Nijun. Or Nijun, Nijun. Yeah, Nijun. It's a Nijun? Nijun, yeah, Nijun melody. Susan, you talk about that. Susan found it. Well, um, I found it because I was very aware of a, um, a whole collection of of music that. Um, was recorded at a synagogue that is like two blocks away from where I live. And, and it's a synagogue where I have 
gone to services a number of times and um, they, they, they use their own um, musical references that are particular to, the, to their, their heritage. Anyway, it's beautiful music in that in, the synagogue has beautiful music, it's well known in the, in the area for having beautiful music. And I was, and I own that CD. CD. <laughs> so, um, and it happens to be um, a, a piece, of a hymn that I find very moving. So it, it, that's that's the sort of little bit of backstory. Mm -hmm. A bit later in the film, when um, Veronica is a young child and the family is living in Versailles, there's some French songs that are are used in the film. Uh, one's an accordion piece. Another is a, I think, a, probably a traditional children's song. And uh, I don't know, Veronica, were those? Yes. Is there very special to you about those selections. Oh, the, the children's song was was you know of course one that I knew in my childhood, <laughs> and uh, very you know very apt for the school and that uh, we went to and and uh, that one worked really well uh, I think. Um, and that's a traditional children's song. There's no reason that Todd would have replaced that. The, the opening piece coming into Versailles, coming into France, is an accordion piece. It is one that we had placed there. Susan and I, we had a kind of a collection of, of music. You know, we each had a sort of library of music. And when we were looking for music before Todd for that opening, we both landed uh, absolutely uh, simultaneously and unknowingly on the very same piece of music. And that was, and that's one of the very few, I'd say that's just about the only one with, with, uh, with the uh, Scott Joplin arranged by, by Todd, the only one that we just said, let's just keep it. And I think Todd, you were fine with that. It's I was, just, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it just, it has its own, uh, it's, it's um, uh, again, a CD that I had that, is a Canadian Canadian artist, um, and I just we just thought it was just terrific, <laughs> so we kept that, and and uh, no no conflict there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But obviously the. Go ahead. Well, I was just curious. Um, just the next thought I one question I had was about the the selection of the Scott Joplin's. Um, Athena, is it? Is it Athena? Um, and that, uh, which was arranged by T Todd, but um, maybe how you came to select that particular piece. And this is at the moment where we learn of your father's death, Ermi's husband, Henry Silver. Susan, Susan, Susan selected it. Uh -huh. Well, actually, there's a, a little bit of a process that, that wasn't um, there. The film went through different stages, and the the whole section in France um, at one point was much longer, and had kind of more more storytelling in it. And Scott Joplin's that piece of music had a very upbeat version, um, very it was charming and very light, and um, I used that in the early sections of the film, which you no longer see. And then when Henry died, there was this same version of, I mean, another version of the music that was very melancholy and, and expressed a lot of loss. And it turns out that I think Scott Joplin's piece was actually written in reference to a loss in his own life, um, which I didn't know at the time, but that's how it got into the film. It was it was a reflection, a, a, a reiteration in just the right um, emotional tones of an earlier piece that was very upbeat and light. And so that's how it that's how it came. And then it just stayed. The other pieces left, and um, but that always felt right. Yeah, and I mean one thing that music outside of a score, you know, music from other sources can do, of course, is to open up the range and scope of the film. You, you can have, you can get a breath of fresh air out of the mind of dog. You know, you can, you can get, just bring in more influences and refresh your ears. And, and that was a, it's a great piece and beautifully played. And 
it has, you know, it's, it locks into the era really nicely. And, um, and so even though it, you know, it's, it's a very, um, it's a scene that's tempting for a composer to want to write for because, you know, loss is always a really rich territory to, to explore. Um, I, it just felt really good there. It felt, it felt like, felt like it made sense there. And so I was happy to, happy to help. One, one thing just in terms of backstory, uh, when we were scoring before Todd, uh, uh, I'd say a lot of the music was music that, that I thought, I mean, we, we both did it, but uh, was music that Ermi would have heard, that Ermi would have liked, that Ermi knew. And, and Scott Joplin happened to be a, a composer that she just loved. She, she loved this, this person's music. And so I think maybe Scott Joplin came into sort of the, the arena of our, of our library through the connection with, with Ermi's uh, fondness for him. So that's just part of the backstory. <laughs> hey, I wanna encourage um, anyone who's watching to, um, and if they have questions to use the chat line and um, in a few minutes, we'll begin to take some of those questions. But one other area I wanted to hear uh, each of you on was the fact that your film was literally completed during the COVID-19 period. And uh, so um, while you worked on it over a period of six years, of course, the um, some of the work with uh, that Todd was doing, some of your um, recording sessions were happening just as things were beginning to shut down here in, in, in the Bay Area, in the East Bay. So, um, okay. I don't know if you want to share some of that part of the saga or what that was like for you to try and continue to work through a more difficult situation. Well, the, the, the saddest part of it is that Susan was in New York and could not come out here. It was just impossible to travel at that point. And, and um, you know, sometimes it's the finishing touches that are most that are most enjoyable, you know, sort of working on the mix together uh, being there for the recording session um, of live musicians. And so we had to finish without Susan in that respect. Uh, the, the, last, the last thing we did was with Phil Perkins, bringing the music and the sound effects and actually creating a mix. And um, Phil and I did that, did that alone. Um, and, and we did it in his studio and we both got tested. We both we both got tested before we agreed to be together with masks and you know separated uh, in his studio, um, and so you know that was um, just leading up to that and worrying about it and delaying it because of fear, and finally establishing that we were going to do it was part of the experience of finishing the film in that way. But it, it um, and we were extremely fortunate to record the music about three or four days before uh, everybody decided we're not doing, we're not getting together anymore. So thank, thank, thank you all for that. And thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to just, I mean, even though I wasn't in, in California for the mix, we, we had been getting just, just to step back for a second, what, what happened because of COVID and the fact that I couldn't come out and because nobody could see each other. I mean, even Veronica and Todd who lived five minutes away from each other couldn't see each other. And Phil was working on the tracks for months, sending us demos of his mixes back and forth that Veronica and I would listen to on our, on our own systems and give him feedback. And, um, and we worked with a colorist in London who um, would be sending us his color corrections and we would have Zoom meetings um, over the course of weeks so that somehow the technology, is what I'm trying to say is that within the COVID experience, somehow we were up and running technologically speaking so that we could finish the film at great distances apart. And it took much more time and it was never a the fun experience of being all together in the same place. 
and the kind of unified emotional experience. It was much more broken up and it took much longer, but it was miraculously accomplished. I mean, we're really happy with the way the film looks, the way the film sounds, and, and we work with wonderful um, people from a great distance. So it was, it was interesting. No. <laughs> Like, you know, even having our film screen now um, is possible because we can do that technically, you know, from a technical point of view, even though we miss very much the experience of being able to be in, a, in an audience together. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we have a question that's coming in from Rosalie Fanshall. She says, so wonderful to hear your talk about the sound element of this gorgeous film. Can you chat about incorporating Hannah Shagula's voice into the score? Into the score? Is that is that a question for me? Uh, into the soundtrack. Into okay. the, let's let's call it the soundtrack, <laughs> if that's okay. I, I, because I don't think that uh, the score, that the musical score, was was. Uh, that Hannah Shigala's voice in any way determined the musical score. Am I right? I think. Except, except that I'm always listening to dialogue when I'm writing for a, for a film, but yeah, other than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, to, but, but in bringing up Hannah Shigala's voice, she certainly brought a sound element to the, to the, to the track, to the, to the experience of hearing the film and uh, which was, uh, you know, a, a gift. I, I would have to say it was a, it was a gift, and we were all all really kind of thrilled with it. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> How was it that you came to approach Hannah Shigula? Um, I I I have a, a dear friend in Berlin who who knows film people, and I asked him whether he could find out uh, if he could find Hannah Shigula's email if he could find my, my access to her email. And he went to the, you know, the proper authorities, he went to the archive and the film, and, and Hanashigala gave permission uh, for her email to be uh, given to me. And, and I wrote her a letter, is really what it came down to. I mean, she was in Paris and I was in France, so geographically it was very convenient, but that wasn't the stress of my letter. I wrote a letter and she, um, responded she said i'm i'm open to your suggestion uh and and um we met because we were in the same in the same location at that time we met and it was just immediate it was i must say immediate you know hannah just said yes and we did a scratch narration you know the day after i met her and and we used that scratch narration in the film and then i went back to record her in Paris when we were ready to really finalize the, the film, but, but she was just so, so game and just very, very, very fortunate. It, I, if, you know, I, I, I can tell a little tiny backstory, just mm -hmm. a quick, quick backstory, which is that when, when we started making the film, I was my mother's voice. I read the, I read the, the, um, I, I read the the memoir, and 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 uh, you know I was pretty attached to that. <laughs> My voice wasn't very developed in the film, and I thought I had the best sort of understanding of the memoir. And if, again, friends, you know, dear film friends, said no, that's not going to work. You are not going to be your mother's voice in the film. You have to find an actress. And I said in a very I said defiantly because I said Hanashibaba, like that. <laughs> You know, like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, and he said, you know, chill, chill. <laughs> but years later, it happened. So that's my backstory. Interesting. Veronica, here's a, a question from Ala Efimova. Hi, Veronica. Can you talk about reconciling your relationship with knowledge of your mother with staying true to the tone of her memoir? I don't understand the question. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand the meaning of the question. 
Yeah, uh, I'll just read it again. Um, can you talk about reconciling your relationship with slash knowledge of your mother with staying true to the tone of her memoir? Okay, I think I understand it a little bit better. Um, uh, my, um, my mother's memoir is for lack of a more subtle word on the upbeat side. She has maintained, she maintained, as she herself says, she's always had a um, you know, commitment to living. And while she is, is telling, telling the story of her life and some of it is deeply tragic, she maintained a kind of, of, of ebullience in the course of telling her life story. And it was for us to sort of pick out the places where you where there was an undertow and curiously enough um, those places were in large part replaced in the film with silence for example um, when when my my mother arrived in london alone and she came to her brother-in-law's house and she says, you know, it was midnight when we got there. Um, she made a remark in the memoir, which read like this. Needless to say, none of us slept that night. And this was a, a line that for me was very moving because I knew that was the best she could say about how awful it was. But the words themselves don't carry the weight of what, what, the, what, what the event was. And so we lost that. Um, I don't know if that, if that and, and, and silence replaced it. We, so so um, one of the ways I guess I reconciled or we reconciled the knowledge of Ermi's story with some of the ways in which she described it was to eliminate some ways in which the words did not really match the feeling of the event and the moment itself. Although I knew they did <laughs> because I knew my mother. Yeah. They were better left out though. <laughs> Is that fair, Susan? Yeah. I wonder, um, we're kind of coming to the end of our hour together. I, are there any um, other points you'd, you'd like to mention about your collaboration together on Ermi or, or something that we sh should touch on? I'd like to say one thing about the collaboration, which is the remarkable thing about a genuine collaboration, which ours was, all, all three of us is that it's completely non-hierarchical. We were absolutely doing, we were just working on the same level um, all, all, all the time. And, and while, you know, it was my mother's story that was sort of irrelevant to the, to the, to the equal nature of our work together. Yeah, I second that. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that, I don't know, I just um, also take for granted without it necessarily um, occurring to me that it could be otherwise, but certainly it's something that's very special to, to this, the experience that we had over a long period of time. And, and then also working with Todd, you know, it was just somehow, um, as he said earlier, when you're all kind of tuned into making something as best as you can because that's what matters and it's not about who says what or in what order, then everybody has permission to, to, to kind of fully be themselves and, and that's very rewarding. You know, there are a couple of uh, questions that are coming in as we're, as we're winding down. Uh, one is from Ruth Santer. She asks, where did you get the old photos you used since so much went down with the ship? 
various family, various family, but, but you know, but because because the photos were um, had a certain quality to them, they were they were as probably in in as in olden days, not just snapshots, boom boom, but more more composed. And they were sent out, you know, the, this is me, this is Ermi with her son that got sent to the, to, the, to the cousin, that got sent to the aunt, that got sent to the brother-in-law. And so they were kept that way. And, and after, after Ermi lost everything, it, it's remarkable how many people obviously sent her what they had. All their, this was true of the, of the photo album of Ermi's apartment. Um, those things were gathered by Ermi from people sending them in, and and people had them because they were beyond beyond the snapshot quality. They had a kind of well, in the olden days, it's like using uh, a thirty-five millimeter camera for news footage, just more stately. And I, I, may I use this opportunity to say one more thing? Of course. I just want to add something to what I said about my mother's text. Hannah just brought so much to it. She, her voice, her reading of it, I think just really penetrated something. So I wanted to say that about Hannah Shigula's reading. Uh, Deborah Heiligman asks, what are you working on now? <laughs> um, well, getting the film, getting the film out there. <laughs> of course, we have film ideas, but that's premature. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Todd, Todd, are you working on, uh, constantly working on music composition? I've been, uh, I'm kind of edging into the filmmaker role. I, my wife and I are, um, are making a documentary and, uh, so I have some music work as well, but we are we're, we're exploring that side of things, which is very interesting and very different. Um, I mean, it's the same work, but it's the same work using different tools that you don't have experience with. And so it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. Yeah. Look forward to seeing what, what you make. And, and Susan, are there projects you've got on the go in New York beyond Ermi? Well, um, I'm in a short period of time, I'm going to um, do an editing project with, um, with Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman, um, one of their sh um, smaller projects. They, they're working on several things, but I'm gonna work with them on something in, in probably in the next month or so. And you're learning Premiere. <laughs> I'm learning a new editing program, much to my chagrin, <laughs> kicking and screaming. Well, I really want to thank all three of you for joining us this afternoon. I want to thank you for making Ermi, which is just a beautiful work um, of great maturity and, and uh, a very important film. Uh, for all of you out there, I hope you will watch Ermi, which is available on the bampfa.org website on the homepage under our uh, film streaming uh, section. And the film will continue to stay up through the end of 2020. Um, we really look forward to sharing um, Ermi as widely as possible um, through virtual cinema. And we look forward to the day when we return to BAMPFA's Barbara Osher Theater and have a chance to see Ermi in, in the Osher Theater with you present. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, Susan. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thanks.